Um, so I'll start with, uh, no, there we go. I'll start with a slide that I first used five years ago or more at a synthetic biology conference, kind of describing where the science sees itself going. And we've had a, a fair bit of that already this morning, you know, big profits, big public benefits, great stuff. So far, so good. Five years ago, I said, things are going to get complicated. And I think they have started to get complicated. Um, and uh, I, I work, and I, I set up 10 years ago the Inogen Centre based in Edinburgh University to look at that kind of complexity and across the board in life sciences. So, so we don't just work in synthetic biology, we work in regenerative medicine, GM crops, translational medicine, uh, stratified medicine, genetic databases. We've done work on all of these, and so we're in a good position to make comparisons across the board. And we um, adopt an approach that um, looks at three different constituencies. So um, here you have the innovation communities who are generating new ideas for processes and products. They're satisfying customers, generating profits. They generate risks and costs to themselves and others, and that's one of the links to the the policy and public communities. The policymakers respond to new products and processes from industry. They license and regulate products uh, and processes. They set standards and they set penalties if you don't comply with the regulation. They respond to public interests and concerns and they balance supposedly industry and, and public interests. The balance shifts periodically and I think it's shifted recently in Europe where 15 to 20 years ago, you could have said that industry had a much stronger influence on government than the public did. I think that balance has shifted quite significantly in Europe and now public pressure groups have a much stronger influence on governments than I think industry does. Although maybe that's just beginning to shift a little bit back again. And then you've got members of the public and the stakeholder groups, they exert political influence. They're the beneficiaries of these new products and processes. They're selective bearers of some risks. And one of the things I want to focus on today, their motivations are often based on values and ideology rather than self-interest. And that's one of the key things I think are driving some of the um, responses to, um, to uh, issues like synthetic biology and, and GM crops. And um, what we've been doing over the last 10 years in the Energy Centre is develop methodologies for looking at these issues and looking at how the combination of all these factors actually determines what products actually reach a marketplace at the end of the day and what products fail along the way. And um, so I guess this, this business of ethics and values and motivations is this bit and it's a little part of the whole process, but there's all the rest of it as well. And how do you actually situate it in its context is an important part of what we need to be doing. Um, so I'm going to start with this innovation system, the innovation value system and its complexity and how we handle that degree of complexity in the research we do. And um, this, this is um, uh, an example of a methodology called ALSIS, Analysis of Life Science Innovation Systems. And um, what we've, we've, we've um, applied this to a few different kinds of cases. The wheat value chain, we've applied it to stratified medicine, um, and most recently we've been applying it to three case studies of small companies setting themselves up as regenerative medicine companies, developing um, stem cell uh, lines as um, a commercial product that can be then sold on to people who want to develop regenerative medicine therapies. Uh, one which is a bio-artificial liver device which will be used something like kidney, trans kidney dialysis is today to save the lives of uh, patients with uh, liver failure. And the third one is producing red blood cells from stem cells and very different challenges, different regulatory challenges and everything else. But we were uh, starting at a very early stage looking at the people who are just beginning to think about how you could commercialize this and how you could, um, how, how you could actually even develop um, a notional business model that would get you to phase one clinical trials, say. That, that was the end point for a lot of them. And what, what we looked at was the way 
it, oops, sorry. Um, the way the, the value chain here, if you're going to get to a product at the end of the day in anywhere in life sciences, you need dozens sometimes of business models in different companies doing different things to combine at the right points in the right ways to actually deliver what you need at the end of the days. And, and, and that's really complex process. How do you make that work when you've got different companies with different business models all trying to serve their own interests? It's not easy. And they need to combine in this value chain. This is the, the value system environment, which contains all the external constraints and enablers that will help that to happen. And you've got regulation, funding, markets, stakeholders. And our data inputs um, to do this analysis were data from interviews, workshops, and published sources. And uh, we, we produced um, maps with the, with the people we were interviewing. And this, is not, this is a notional map. This is not a real life map because it would be too complicated. But if, you wa if you're interested, send me an email. And I've got a report on the... Um, the regenerative medicine project, which is hot off the press, and I could send you a copy showing how we do it in more detail. What we do is we interview groups of people and individuals who are planning to develop this um, project. We map it in this way what they think they need to do now, what they need to do next, what they need to do next, what they need to do next, and what are the influences coming in from this external value system environment that might stop them or help them along the way. And um, the, the, the real life maps like this started off with well over 100 boxes on the map. And they then discussed with people in, in the case study saying, are you sure that one comes before that one? Why, what, why doesn't it come later? When do you have to start thinking about A, B, or C? Does it not come earlier in the chain? And, and that process was very helpful to the people who were taking part in the research because it made them rethink how they were developing their business models. So we were analyzing them, but at the same time, we were helping them to understand the business model they had to develop and the environment, the system environment into which it would have to be placed. And this, this was a, a thought experiment around stratified medicine where you've got, um, you, you need to have two different uh, industry sectors collaborating in this value chain. So um, down here, you've got the drug development business model. Stratified medicine involves the development of a drug and the co-development of a diagnostic to identify the patients that will be receptive to that. So you've got, you've got the, the drug development model here and the, uh, bio, the diagnostic development model up here. They're both subject to regulatory requirements, but they're subject to very different regulatory requirements. Much lighter touch regulation on a diagnostic and therefore normally much faster um, movement from concept through to a market with a diagnostic than with a drug. And um, the challenge is this core development bit of the value chain here where the two have to interact with one another. And, and the problem we identified from a regulatory point of view was that the regulators are moving very fast to regulate diagnostics in the same way as they regulate drugs and to say that your diagnostic has to be co-developed along with the drug. The problem there is that um, diagnostic companies will not be able to bear the cost of that. And so what will happen if you insist on that approach to the regulation of diagnostics is the only people who can develop the diagnostics will be the big multinational companies. Now, I've got no objection to that, but if you're a small diagnostic company wanting to make a profit out of this, it's something you need to think about. And, and so that's how we use these uh, models to... Uh, to develop our analysis. And what we, and I'm interested to hear about people who are bringing in mathematicians and computer models into, into a synthetic biology, because what we'd like to be able to do is to have a mathematician develop a model where there is a, a, a strong impact from the regulatory, uh, re regulatory requirements on this value chain at this point. We'd like to be able to quantify that and to say to the uh, diagnostic company, um, how, how much can you bear in cost in those terms? We haven't found a modeler who's willing to do that kind of thing. Most economists see that as beneath them because it's too simple, I think. But uh, we, we, we would really like to be able to do that. And I, I hope I haven't taken up too much time on that. But I did want to emphasize that 
the social sciences are just as important in helping to develop these kinds of business model approaches as they are in looking at the, the ethical aspects. And most of the synthetic biology examples we've heard today at least would be very amenable to this kind of early stage look at your business model, what new science do you need to develop on the way to getting there, what regulations do you need to take account of, how are the regulations changing, and that kind of thing is, is normally um, not part of the, the kinds of thought experiments that we do. Um, so uh, before I go on to complexity and stakeholder engagement, I'm not going to talk much about the regulatory side today, but uh, if you look on the Energen Centre's website, you'll see a report that we did for the International Risk Governance Council on the governance of synthetic biology, which um, has, has had quite a lot of uh, influence in regulators in Europe and America, making the point that um, you, you really need to be adaptive and flexible in your regulation of this new technology, and setting rigid regulations too soon would be um, a very bad move, uh, and, and so on. But I'm moving on now to this point that I was making that it's not about the eth it's not about ethics. What it is about is um, politics and ideology. I would say it, it's it, the, the the public um, responses to GM crops and to uh, synthetic biology potentially are here on this table. It, the, not the public responses, I should, I should correct that, it's not the public responses, it's the responses of a small but very influential group of NGOs who represent at most 10 to 15 percent of the public. So um, if, you, if, you, if you engage with an issue uh, from the point of view of self-interest, you know, think about somebody's a developer wants to develop something in your neighbourhood and you don't want it to happen in your backyard. It's the NIMBY response. You, you, will, you will maybe object to that particular development. You won't object to all developments of that nature no matter where they occur. So it will be location specific and locally organised. You can usually resolve the problem by providing information, i.e. it won't be as bad for you as you think or it might even be good for you. You, so you can give information. You can give compensation. If this is going to cause some problems for your community, then the developer can provide a benefit for the community that will balance that problem. Um, and you can negotiate around these issues with the developers and the stakeholders. If you give concessions on one side or the other, then you generally get mutual accommodation. And you get the kind of discussion that people have been trying to have around issues related to GM crops for the last 15 years or so. And frankly, it's not been working because really it's on this side of the debate. It's ideologically based engagement. So the, 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 the engagement with the general public is not always ideological, but the problem is that the engagement which brings in people from NGOs in the early stages of GM crop development enabled those NGOs to frame synthetic bio, um, to frame GM crops in the minds of the public. So what the public think about GM crops in Europe is very much determined by the kind of images that were presented when the NGOs were given the opportunity through engagement exercises to totally dominate the press response to uh, GM crop development and therefore to mould and frame that issue in the minds of the public. And a lot of the public are not ideologically against GM crops but they're influenced by these ideological arguments more than they're influenced by the other side, just because they've been more numerous. And, and actually, you know, again, it, it's, not, it's not huge numbers in that category. You, you've got in here, not, not, not to size, not to scale, you've, the uncommitted members of the public, probably about 60% of the UK public, are in the don't know, don't really care very much, um, a little bit worried because I've heard some things that are not so nice about GM crops, but then... Um, certainly not ideological. And so if you engage with the public generally, you won't get this kind of response. But this is the NGO response to GM crops on the whole. And, and so it spreads across related and sometimes unrelated developments. And that's why the response to GM crops is likely to spread over to synthetic biology. They're, they're closely enough related 
for the images and the analogies to, to be nicely translated across. It's organized nationally or internationally, and we've seen a good few examples of that recently uh, in, in the UK and in uh, America. It gets very difficult to resolve because if you give information um, to these groups, they treat it as propaganda. Compensation is seen as bribery and negotiation is seen as betrayal. So you've no form of leverage to change the, 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 the kind of discussion you get. And we've seen in the European regulatory system for GM crops that if you give concessions, you get an escalation of demands. And, and so um, th that's, that's the way it's been going. Now, I have to give another quick qualification here because everybody who gets engaged with any issue, for, for all of us, it, it's a mixture of interests and values and ideology. You know, we, we, we all have um, political opinions and, well, most of us have, and those politics will influence how we respond to things. Um, so, so we can't say that it's in entirely either or, interest-based or ideology-based. What I'm saying is that's what's driving the debate and the dialogue at the moment, and, and it's not interest-based, it's ideological. And, and um, risk has very little to do with it. It, it. Risk will be invoked as part of the argument, but it's not really risk that people are worried about. It, risk is a political opportunity to dominate the debate about, about these issues. Um, and uh, I, I think one, one, of the, one of the questions that, that gets asked a lot is, you know, how do you tell which side you're dealing with? It's not always that clear. And, and I think um, that, that one, of the, one of the ways to tell is the way evidence is used. Good, good approaches to using evidence is one of the first casualties uh, when, you, when you're here. That, that uh, again, inf information's propaganda. And, and um, the, the NGOs will use information that suits their case. They will not listen to information that doesn't suit their case. So you can't have a dialogue that says, but the science says this. Um, that, that, that doesn't influence things at all. Um, you also get ideology in company decision making. Um, and and it, it's, it doesn't just happen with NGOs and, and the public groups. Um, Monsanto and GM crops. Monsanto's approach to GM crops was ideological. They had a vision, and this vision was a sustainable world delivered through GM crops, and their decision-making about GM crops was visionary. And, and that's why the Monsanto and um, Greenpeace debate was so virulent because it was visionary from both sides of the debate. It was ideological from both sides of the debate. And um, we, we interviewed Monsanto. Uh, we, we did a big case study of Monsanto decision-making about GM crops in the early 1990s. And, uh, you know, they, there were quotes from the CEO saying, um, we have to buy these seed companies as our route to market because it's part of our vision you know, no matter who else wants these seed companies, we're going to have them to fulfill our vision. And Monsanto ended up paying vastly greater sums of money than were warranted for the seed companies it bought up in order to satisfy its vision. And, and it nearly went bust in the process. And, and uh, that's where you actually do something that's against your self-interest in the long run because it fulfills this vision. And it's another sign that you're, you're ideological about this. I, I heard an executive in a company um, talk about how his, his company was developing um, a, a stem cell therapies uh, based on human embryonic stem cells for Parkinson's disease. Now, this, this was 15 years ago, and this person came from a multi... No, 10 years ago, and this person came from a multinational company. And I, I said, how on earth are you going to make a profit out of this? It doesn't sound like the kind of thing a multinational company would want to get engaged in at this point. And uh, I, he said, well, it's interesting you ask that question. Actually, our CEO has a relative. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so on. So, you know, that was, that was not rational decision making. It was, it was a value-based, at least, decision. There's an interesting issue coming around out of, out of synthetic biology, biofuels versus high-value petrochemicals. There's a, a well-known company that sees itself developing high-value petrochemicals as a route at the end of the day to developing biofuels. And I've asked the question, why would you go to the next stage? 
you know, there's a massive market out there for high value chemicals and you can get the high value that's warranted by a, a synthetic biology application, which is for the foreseeable future not going to be that cheap. Why would you have this aim to go for petrochemicals when there are so many competitors out there and they're relatively cheap? And, you know, it was, this is our vision. We want to save the world through biofuels, you know, and, and I wouldn't buy shares in a company that took that attitude to its investment decision. You know, it, it, it's, um, it, it's not unheard of in all sorts of uh, walks of life. But this question about evidence and how you use it and, and the NGOs lack of commitment to taking on board the quality of the evidence they use to support their decisions because any NGO um, uh, uh, statements about GM crops so far is, is generally using evidence that's not well backed up by science and evidence in quotes. And, and this, is a, this is a quote from Arthur Miller, a, a little essay that Arthur Miller wrote talking about his writing of the play The Crucible, um, which I, if, I don't know if you know it, but it was about the McCarthy um, stage in American politics when um, people were being accused of being communists. And, and um, he's describing here the situation of the drug, the, the judge in Salem who uh, was being asked to, who was asking for evidence that these people were witches. And people were, of course, trying very hard to find the evidence. But he said the key point in the play was when the judge realized that he didn't need evidence to brand somebody as a witch. And he said, it was as though the release, the absence of real evidence was a release from the burdens of the world. You know, evidence is effort. Leaping to conclusions is a wonderful pleasure. And, and we have seen so much of that ar around the, the GM crop uh, debates uh, and so on. So complexity in the stakeholder environment. Um, I, I think something very interesting is happening just now. And there's a question mark, I think, whether 2012 is the new 1998. Now, I don't know if our American colleagues will understand that question, but... Um, 1998 was the year when the NGO opposition to GM crops as an advocacy coalition really took off. It was a very powerful advocacy coalition. It involved um, environmental groups, uh, consumer organizations, um, third world uh, activist groups, all together coming together and saying, GM crops are bad, we don't want GM crops. And, and it was a powerful advocacy coalition. It was backed up by a press campaign where you had the major, uh, major and responsible, in quotes, newspapers actually having um, an anti-GM campaign which was regularly reinforcing the claims made by the NGOs about GM crops. So it was, it was a, one of these kind of tipping points in, in uh, the stage of... Uh, public opposition to uh, the products and also in press opposition and the politicians felt in Europe felt that they couldn't ignore these, these pressures and um, made some very significant changes to the way it was regulated and even if you comply with this very draconian regulatory system for GM crops now you still can't get anything onto the market in Europe because of uh, political pressures. Now I, I've seen I, I, interesting escalation of events, particularly in the USA in the last few months, which I think could imply that there's another such event happening and um, it's going to happen in the US as well as in Europe this time. I think a lot of Americans have said it couldn't happen here. Well, I'm not so sure it couldn't happen. And, and um, there, there was um, the Paul Rabineau event in October 2011 where uh, Paul Rabineau resigned very publicly from the uh, group that he was involved with in Berkeley. There was a fair bit of press attention in the States because he was saying that these scientists are not listening to us social scientists. These scientists are doing dangerous things in their labs. I have to resign because I'm an honourable person. And, and um, that, was, that was an interesting um, a, a event that I wasn't related to the next one, this, this Woodrow Wilson, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation staff at the Woodrow Wilson Foundation had an article in Nature um, that talked about the four key risks of synthetic biology. And uh, the, out, the, the answer to, uh, the, the conclusions at the end of that document said something like, 
um, that um, th this, this is potentially very dangerous stuff. We need to call a moratorium on certain on, on any research that involves open open uh, trials of uh, GM of synthetic biology material in the public. I, the reason I haven't got the details on these is that um, I was going to put them in in my room last night in the hotel and I couldn't get onto the internet. So I'm winging it here. And, and uh, I do have these data somewhere, but I, I haven't got it here. Then there was a, a, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation has, I don't know if it still has, but a month or two ago it had a questionnaire on its, um, on its website that was very bad social science. It was a list of questions about we're going to have to control this technology. How would you like us to control it? And um, there was nothing in that questionnaire that would allow people to have an alternative view to we've got to control this technology. Now, I agree we've got to control it, but that, the, the emphasis was all one way. And uh, it, it was, uh, I, I think it was the kind of questionnaire that, as a social scientist, I would have been critical of. Um, Friends of the Earth US had a report which was widely widely reported and discussed um, a, about a month ago, which was a, an advocacy coalition of 101 NGOs calling for a moratorium on certain aspects of synthetic biology research. Um, the 30% uh, of these NGOs were based in America, which is interesting. Uh, it, was, it was Friends of the Earth America that, that uh, developed it. So you do have the, ger the, the germ of an advocacy coalition in the United States um, that, that could build up into something really significant. I saw uh, somebody sent me a web link a couple of days ago which was um, advertising for funds um, for an activist group to mount a public TV campaign against Monsanto in America. And it was full, and I'm not carrying any torch for Monsanto, but I think Monsanto, in that sense, kind of represents the industry. Uh, it's the easiest target among all the companies. And um, I, I, think, uh, I, th I think that's bad news for industry in general. And it was full of these images of white people in suits with gas masks, you know. And um, they, they, I'm sure they'll get the money. Um, so uh, I think that's probably something that, um, again, is going to build up. Now, I, I, I've asked the question at the bottom of the slide, why might it be different this time? Well, if you look at that advocacy coalition that, that was uh, in, involved in this Friends of the Earth report, there were some interesting absences. Greenpeace wasn't there. Worldwide Fund for Nature wasn't there. And, and they're two of the key uh, advocacy groups in this area. I don't know why they weren't there. It would be interesting to know. But, but that, was, that was interesting. Um, if, if you look at the recent events in, um, in, in the UK here um, around um, the Rothamsted Research Centre where there was an advocacy group uh, attempted to invade the site and to destroy a crop trial and they were prevented from doing so. That was the very first time that's happened in the UK in 15 years. Every other crop trial that's been attempted in the UK in the last 15 years has been destroyed by activists. And um, it, the fact that it was stopped is very interesting. It's an interesting shift in perspective. It's also interesting because the Rothamsted scientists made a really interesting plea for um, a, a more balanced um, approach to everything, for, for discussions with the NGO people. It was rejected, but they tried the reasonable approach. Um, and also interesting in that the press response to that was very different from, from what it's been in the past. There was much less of the um, who do these scientists think they are, um, you know, and, and much more of the maybe this might be useful stuff. Um, I think um, there was one flaw, I think, in the approach that the, the Rothamsted group took, and I think that was their constant reiteration that industry was not involved in this trial, and therefore that was okay, wasn't it? with the implication that if industry had been involved, that would have been a criticism. And, and I think we've, we've got to get out of this problem in Europe that survey after survey of the public in Europe and comes up with a finding that if a company makes money out of something, that's a bad thing. You know, we're never going to be competitive in Europe until our public understand innovation processes and the role of innovation 
in, in developing uh, new technology and new benefits. You know, they, it's fine telling the public about the science. They do need to understand something about the science, I think. But they also need to understand better how industry is governed and how industry develops new products and what it takes to get a product from here to a marketplace at the end of the day. How many millions of pounds or dollars it takes and how much time it takes and how many regulations you have to meet on, on the path. So if we can get that understanding across, I think that's a good thing. One of the reasons why I think it might be different this time in America, and, and different in the less good sense, is that this is an election year, and um, I think that probably hasn't... Um, the, the, the activists are not oblivious to that fact, and, and it could be that they see an opportunity to influence the politics of the situation um, um, and maybe get some commitments from some of the politicians who are running their campaigns to put a stop to this synthetic biology if I'm elected, kind of thing. I don't know. But um, I, I think it might be different this time. might be better, might be worse. But uh, I, I, I want to come back to this. It's complicated. It's hugely complicated. And focusing on the, this, this bit down here is all very well and it's important but we do need to bear in mind all the rest of it because if we don't get the rest of it right, we still won't have products at the end of the day. And, and we can do a lot in the social sciences to help these processes of innovation governance interactions and innovation public interactions and governance public interactions as well as just focusing on, on that one aspect. Um, but, and, and there's one final but um, in, in order to solve this complexity. I, I think... I think science and innovation have not been well served by the social sciences over the last 15 years or so when it's become a really prominent problem. We've, we've had a very narrow group of social science uh, disciplines um, focused on these areas and it's generally been sociology and something called science and technology studies which has had a very narrow view of what needs to be done and has focused almost entirely on the public attitudes aspect, but they're not social psychologists, they're sociologists. And, and a social psychologist would have had a very different perspective on the public attitude research that's been done around GM crops and synthetic biology and nanotechnology too. So I, I think we need a paradigm shift in the social sciences. And um, I, I think that's something that we're also working on, but uh, that's something that also takes time. And, and I, I find myself tilting at so many windmills these days that uh, I don't know which direction to turn next. But, but I think there's an awful lot to be done in this area and there's a lot that we could do better. Um, and, and hopefully we will make a small difference somewhere in the end of the day. Thank you.